Hi, today we're just going to be making bolts, but these are decorative bolts made out of bronze from a piece of bar stock that I had previously knurled. So we're not looking at the knurling process, but the um, turning process and the cutting of threads. And this thread cutting is a little unusual because there are shoulders at both ends. Whereas usually if you're cutting a bolt, you'll have a shoulder at one end, usually nearest the chuck, and turn towards the chuck until you hit this shoulder. Um, you can also turn the tool upside down and use it in reverse and turn in the opposite direction so you don't hit the shoulder. But in my case, I've got shoulders at both ends and I can't put a nut on it to test the thread. Usually if I'm making a thread, I'll check it at some stage by putting a nut on it. Well, I can't do that because it's got shoulders on both ends. Sound crazy, but I think you'll realize what I'm doing when you finally see it. Uh, once these bolts have been made, we want to cut two flats on the side to put a spanner on, and this is done by putting the bolts in a four jaw chuck and turning the sides off. So uh, let's get on with it. We're going to start by using ridethegeartrain.com software that I wrote and is free online. Here it is, pulled up on an iPad, and it's used for calculating what gears to use in the gear train when you want to cut a thread. And you can see here that I've requested a thread with um, 10 threads per inch, it's an imperial. And I'm willing to accept up to 0.5% inaccuracy in the results. And it comes up with 16 different uh, gear combinations that will give this. Uh, here I'm looking at line 3 on the table. And it says it's going to have 10 threads per inch with zero error. A 20 tooth gear with anything between, that means an idle wheel. And a 56 tooth gear on the lead screw. And to put into the program my actual set of gears, uh, which I have. And then I'm going to select the 56 and the 20. Have that set, put them on. And an 80 idler wheel usually. Okay. 6380. So I'm going to use this as the, as the idler. There's the 56 tooth gear there. This, um, this uh, stud gear has a tendency to flop right through, so I've got a little screw on there so I can hang on to it so it doesn't fall inside the works. But it turns at the same speed as the spindle. I just realized something else I have to do. This gear is not going to line up with the um, idler wheel. It has to be moved across in um, one position. And there's a spacer in there to take out. I think. Yes. So take that spacer off. What's going on? Uh, often they don't have a spacer, they'll just use a, another gear as a spacer. It's going to work, I think, here. Yeah. This one. If it doesn't want to mesh, then we have to undo the banjo with the square nut on the top here. Which loosens the whole arm that this is uh, pivoting on. So now I can move it up and down and make it mesh. I think we're away. It's a 40 and a 56 with an idler between. And back here. And this will have to be in the up position for the tool to move towards the chuck, which is to get a right hand thread. If you move away from the chuck, you get a left hand thread. This is a silicon carbide tip tool I had on there. And uh, I'm going to put my thread cutting tool. I've just checked that it was slightly off 55, so I reground it. Okay, we now set up pretty well. Here to do some turning. I've got the um, special tool already mounted there. Checked that it was on centre. And a centre back up to the 
work here. Let's lock it. And I'll be going from right to left, cutting. And let's see. That's got that's reading two on the surface, but I think I better reset it to the zero if I can make it turn around. So then I know from that my depth that I've cut to. Don't actually know of hand what I need to go to. It'll be on the thread cutting chart though. Three quarter inch, ten threads per inch. We're starting with 19 millimeters. Set this one at zero. And then bring this up to the surface. And just in case I move it or bump it, I'll put this on zero too so I can come back to the same point if necessary. So the cross lights on zero, the Compound slides on zero, and that's the one I'll be advancing as I cut, it, cut the depth. At this point, I realized that I had set the compound slide for a 60 degree thread, which is metric. BSW thread is 55 degrees, so I had to reset it to 27 degrees. Half of 55 is 27 and a half, and you subtract a little bit. So I made it about 27 degrees for the angle that you advance the tool. And I had to readjust the compound slide and cross slide micrometers. Okay, Alan Key goes back on the rack. This looks like a well-worn key. Yes, that's the one. Okay, by loosening this Allen key here, I can make this part swivel around here without altering the end play on the shaft because it's on a separate, separate uh, arrangement. Back to zero. And firm it up a bit. It doesn't have to be tight, actually. Okay. And really just want to make a scratch mark the first time around and check the um, that I've got the pitch right. So what's the iPad say? Um, the 42s with the 56 in B3 as I predicted. That one was A3 and this one's B3. Okay. So we can move this one to B. And this one's three, which is the third hole, of course. It's got a separate little clamp on it because the original one broke. So I've got the gear train set up, the gearbox set up. I've got the reverse lever in a position to move towards the chuck, I hope. Oh, I should have shown you before, I'm going to put this selector on the apron in the middle position so that then I can use the half nuts. So I've actually got the half nut engaged there. Notice there's a fair bit of play in the carriage movement and we have to be careful about uh, taking that up when it starts to thread especially if there's not much load on it rather than using the thread dial indicator to get the uh, tool engaged in the lead screw in the correct place i just use the motor to rewind but what that does is it takes up the slack in one direction and when your reverse direction is to start cutting the thread you need to make sure you take up that slack again before it starts cutting or it'll cut the groove in the wrong place okay here's my Thread pitch gauge. Back on there. It's got such a shine on the metal, it's hard to see. Yep, looks spot on. Okay. If I'd marked the surface with a felt pen or with uh, layout ink, uh, that uh, scratch mark would have been much clearer. So I've got the 10 threads per inch all right. The other thing I didn't check is that I've got this actually positioned correctly and it's not quite. zero again. I think I'm ready to go this time. You'll notice that I'm making good use of the variable speed motor that will also run in reverse. This is a direct current motor out of a treadmill that I've described in a previous YouTube video and there's another YouTube video talking about how the pulse width modulator speed control works. Put the speed control unit inside a plastic box which is positioned above the lathe so you'll see me reaching for it. And inside the box I put a computer fan to make sure it kept cool and that makes a lot of noise you can hear on this video. Since then I've put a speed controller on the fan itself and that's now a lot quieter. Now to fill the soundtrack here I'll tell you a bit about the uh, steam engine we're making these for. It's a tangy stationary steam engine. has a 9 inch piston with a 15 inch stroke double acting steam engine. 
and it was used to drive uh, stamper batteries during the gold rush in New Zealand and is now being restored. Uh, we've poured new white metal bearing as in the big end bearing and I turned a bearing for the wrist joint uh, and um, these two pieces and um, the main engineer actually is uh, Nelson Valiant and uh, he's done most of the highly technical parts but I did get to install a piston myself which was nice and uh, it's running now very beautifully. Here I'm using a 60 degree triangular file to clean up the thread. So finally you get to see why it is that I've got um, two shoulders on this thread. It's actually two bolts and we're just going to part it off in the middle. And I did it this way so I'd only have to cut the thread once instead of twice. But it did make things a little bit more complicated. So here's one of the bolts uh, getting a bit trimmed off. Now I want to cut a piece off with the parting tool and I've had problems with uh, trying to part from the front side so I made this uh, rear parting tool tool post which I described in yet another video in my set and here I am installing it. You may have noticed that the other bolt had a spherical dome on the top. I'm now wanting to make a similar dome on this bolt. And I'm doing it by making a series of cuts of different depths and lengths to make a sort of a pyramid-like uh, shape on the top of the bar. Uh, and we'll then you use the compound slide to make a bit of a slope. Uh, and then I'll use a forming tool to finish it off. Since I made this video, I've become more aware of safety precautions that one should take when using machinery like a lathe. And I've learned this from other YouTube videos, particularly Joe Pye. See, I'm wearing a, a jacket with long sleeves on here. I've also got these copper protectors on the vise so that the vise doesn't damage the bronze uh, knurled finish. But if I got my sleeve caught in one of those bits of copper, it could uh, yank my arm in pretty fast. So that's not very good. And so I've now got a jacket that doesn't have sleeves on it. I'm also wearing a wedding ring, which should go and has gone. And a watch that has gone. Um, so as long as I remember to do all these things and I'm turning in future, it should be a bit safer. And since you can see me here using sandpaper, um, you should, when you hold sandpaper, make it so that if, if it catches on something, it'll just tear straight out of your hand and won't drag your hand into something. So don't wrap the sandpaper around your fingers. Um, using a file like that is also a bit risky. It might pay to at least think about what would happen if the file got caught on the chuck and think about what direction it'll go and it'll probably go straight towards you. And a similar theory applies to the uh, polishing cloth too. You have to hold that so that it can tear out of your hand easily. I probably shouldn't uh, lie the four jaw chuck down on the ways like that as they may damage the ways but uh, I just did that for the camera actually I don't normally do that. Now I want to put a little flat on each side of the bolt so that it can be tightened up with a crescent spanner just two flats and I'm doing this using a facing process and the four jaw chuck pretty straightforward really. Here I started using one of my uh, usual silicon carbide tools but then decided that uh, they don't like intermittent cutting, they chip very easily. So instead I changed to a high speed steel tool. Then I had to check that the top surface of the tool was at the same level as the center. So I rotated the whole thing around until the tool touched the center and uh, checked the height. Made some adjustment actually to the t um, quick change tool post and then swung it around again to actually use it. The intermittent cutting can create a bit of impact on the work as it's spinning around in a forge or chuck like this. So I'm making very light cuts. So I don't want to knock the piece of work out and have it come flying across the room at me. If the center line of the bolt isn't perfectly parallel with the face of the chuck, it'll make a wedge-shaped flat instead of nice parallel sides. So I've been quite careful to try to make the bolt parallel to the chuck. Next we flip over the bolt so to do the flat on the opposite side. It's quite tricky to get it uh, positioned on the unfortunate chuck so that the two sides do come out parallel to each other. 
and I won't show you that whole process because it's basically the same as the other side and we'll call this finished and right at the very end you can see it installed on the tangy steam engine Thank you.